Okay, we are live. I'm Joe Terosian, and this is the Burbank Faith Virtual Good Morning for April the 16th, 2023. Uh, a little bit different this morning. Uh, I am just going to answer some questions. My glasses look like they're off today. I don't know. Um, uh, going to answer some questions this morning because I am not preaching at the in-person service. I will be at the in-person service. But uh, actually, we have scheduled uh, Shirley for Shea. She is going to share out of the book of Ruth since we are working our way through the Old Testament. These glasses seem very strange, don't they? Um, man, it's going to drive me crazy. Um, so Shirley is going to be uh, bringing the message in person. But I'm here online sharing and I will be in service today. So I encourage you to be in service today. It's not too often you get somebody other than me uh, sharing, and Shirley does a really, really good job. So, uh, boy, this is going to drive me bonkers. What did I do to my glasses? So talk amongst yourselves. Actually, uh, we're going to read a short verse, and then I'm going to answer questions because people have been asking me questions uh, for a while on why I say certain things, why I believe certain things and uh and such so uh we'll uh we'll get to it here there we go man it's even worse i don't know it's gonna drive me crazy the whole time i don't know there we go i guess and uh so uh um so first peter chapter 3 verses uh, verse 15 we know this verse peter says but in your hearts honor christ uh the lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, all right? That means that let's not turn it into a crazy argument where you're fighting the whole time, but let's, uh, let's, uh, let's get along and let's just share what we believe, good stuff. But also, back up what you say. Um, be prepared to make a defense. Uh, quite often in Christianity, we have this thing where we have received knowledge and we just take what our parents told us or a Sunday school teacher or a pastor told us or somebody we heard on the on, on the TV or, or, or the radio and we just run with it like it's that's it. And you know what? Most of the time it's true, but far too often we don't do our own studying. And uh, and so so we have to ask questions. And if we're not asking questions, we are not um, we are not growing. We are just trusting other people. And when people fail, we fail with them because everything we believe is wrapped up in those individuals. So um, <clears throat> this morning, I am just going to be answering uh, some questions that have been put to me on things I say, and uh, it should be fun. I've been wanting to do this for a while, but I didn't want to lose uh, traction in terms of what we've been preaching uh, in the Old Testament. So one, I use the expression, this is the, what do I mean when I say a believing loyalty in Jesus Christ? Well, the expression is not mine. Um, I did pick it up from a theologian named uh, Michael Heiser, who recently passed away. And, uh, and, and it comes down to what a Christian is. And I've, I've dealt with this most of my whole journey at Burbank because we have so many people that can come in for six months, realize they can't afford to live in LA, and then move away. I mean, we have had countless people. As I've shared uh, many times before, when I got to Burbank, we had less than 30 in the sanctuary. And uh, and then, of course, I've been there 23 years. We have lost close to 130 to 135 people that have come and moved away. And uh, I think only maybe two of those families, maybe about six, six people combined in these families, uh, left out of any form of dissatisfaction. You know, they moved away. Uh, they couldn't afford to live in the area. And, you know, if we held on to all those people, you know, and their children that they had subsequently and the friends they make subsequently, uh, <clears throat> our numbers would have been someplace else. But uh, but uh, they, they, they come and they go, and each one comes with their own set of issues, right? And they, they, they are nervous. And you find out what they're nervous about is they don't know if they're Christians or not. And if you read John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, uh, his unique son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
And we would point that out to them that what is the condition of faith? The condition, the condition of salvation, I'm sorry, is faith. That's it. Uh, all you have to do is believe in who Jesus is. In fact, there's a, there's a, a short video by Alistair Begg, that Scottish guy, the minister, that talks about the thief on the cross. And it says he wasn't baptized. He wasn't taken through a membership class. <coughs> he can't quote any of the, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. <coughs> and people are asking, what's he doing in heaven? It's because Jesus said he can come. And because he believed in who Jesus was. And that is the condition. The condition of salvation is whoever believes in him. Not whoever believes in him and baptism by submersion. It's not whoever believes in him and believes in Revelation the same way how Lindsay believes in Revelation. Whoever believes in him and, you know, puts ash on their forehead every time. It doesn't say any of those things. It just says, who believes in him? That's the condition for salvation. And so that, that's it. It's a believing loyalty in Jesus Christ. Salvation, as a reminder, and I, I've said this before, salvation cannot be lost. You know, because salvation is not performance-based, okay? It's not based on your performance. It's a gift. It's free. And all you got to do is believe. That, that theologian Heiser also said, maybe it wasn't his quotation, but I've heard him say it, is that that which cannot be obtained by moral perfection cannot be lost by moral imperfection. Meaning, you're not going to be perfect. No one is expecting you to be perfect. Anyone expecting you to be perfect is crazy and uh, not living in reality. But here's the deal. You can't lose your salvation, but you can reject it, okay? The uniqueness of your creation and the image of God means you have free will. You can choose yes or no, right? I believe um, who Jesus is and I will follow, but I know I won't be perfect but I will continue to follow. I will never worship any other gods. David wasn't perfect. You know how I feel about David. And um, the key thing to note with David is he never worshiped another god. And I can say this with absolute confidence. Absolute confidence that's going to be very uh, controversial here for about a split second. My, uh, my statement with absolute confidence is I never sin. There, there's the controversy, without me knowing it, okay? I never sin without me knowing it. I know when I'm in the wrong. I know when I've acted foolish or done something uh, contrary to what Jesus would have me do. And the reason I know it is because his spirit dwells within me, dwells within you, dwells within us. And it's always convicting, always course correcting. So... I don't worship any other gods. I know who Jesus is. I have a believing loyalty in him. And that, that is what a Christian is. Someone with a believing loyalty in Jesus Christ. Not the person who goes to church all the time and gives all their money and does all these great, progressive, wonderful social things. Uh, no, you're, you're not. That doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is a believing loyalty in Jesus. Rick Savage, thank you so much for clicking on. Um, so that was one. Two, the other thing that, that, that came to me is I use this expression a lot, authority of scripture. And uh, that's it. Yeah, I believe in the authority of scripture. Do I believe the Bible was perfectly translated from the Greek to the English, right? From the Greek to the Latin to the English? No, it can't be perfectly translated because all the languages... But in terms of being inspired by God, yeah, it's inspired by God. The message is truth. And there are going to be some imperfections in translation, but not how it was received from God. And also, <coughs> the other thing I don't believe in is I don't believe that our, uh, our writers, the people who wrote the scripture, were just automatons, right? They weren't just not thinking and just writing, you know, that they were being led by the Spirit and wrote in their words, because we do have distinction, right? We can distinct Paul's words from Peter's words, and we can distinct Matthew's gospel from John's gospel. And if they were all just automatons, just writing and channeling, yeah, I don't believe that, all right? In fact, I think it lends more credibility to the Bible when you see the subtle differences uh, to that. Uh, but in regards to the authority of Scripture, basically it is, 
if I can't defend something in scripture, I won't preach it. That's it. I mean, there are stuff I'll have great discussions about, but if I can't defend something in scripture, I just won't preach it. I'm all in on Nazarene doctrine. I'm all in on Nazarene doctrine, but you know, I've never, and I've written well over a thousand sermons now. I mean, quite a bit. I think I'm in the 12 to 1400 range since COVID in terms of messages I've preached to Burbank Faith and Burbank Faith Virtual. And I've never written or crafted a single sermon about not drinking, not dancing, or not going to the movies, all those, those Nazarene uh, foundational things, right? And you know why I don't write messages or share messages about not drinking, not dancing, not going to the movies? Because I can't defend it in scripture. So I won't preach it. I'm all in on Nazarene doctrine, but I can't defend those things. However, I will say the Holy Spirit, if alive in you, will cause you to question all that you consume from food and beverage to, to, to entertainment. Uh, getting drunk doesn't glorify God or advance the kingdom. And so, so we put those things off because they don't glorify God. Uh, uh, and, and, and we have to have that active discernment of the spirit working within us. So it's not, oh, that's a rule of the church. No, no, no. It's the spirit doesn't want me to do this. I, 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 I heard somebody share just, just at the table last Sunday, they gave up drinking alcohol, but it was the Holy Spirit that convicted them, not Nazarene theology. And so that's really important. Um, I don't want to preach something I can't defend in Scripture. Jesus did turn the water into wine, and it wasn't because their water was all corrupt and it wasn't fermented, and you know we know how this goes. Uh, the larger point here is Scripture has to have authority. A corrupt view of Scripture, a corrupt bibliology, leads to a corrupt theology. A corrupt theology leads to a corrupt Christology, how you view Christ. And that leads to a corrupt pneumatology and view and work of the spirit, right? The second you hear some jack wagon behind a pulpit or a microphone diminish the word of God, scripture, you know you are in the wrong church. Preach it, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Um, Walter Martin had this fantastic quote, and this was from 40 years ago, okay? 40 years ago, Walter Martin preached this around 1980, 1981. Point number one, every major theological seminary that has turned from orthodox Christianity began with a disbelief of biblical doctrine. There wasn't a single exception. This corrupt bibliology then led to the next step. Their, their theology began to be touched by it. Their view of the cross, the virgin birth, were both immediately questioned. Then came the miracles of Christ. And finally, they had emptied the gospel of all of its content. They were simply using the outward shell so that they could go on collecting money from the people and the churches because they knew that if the people in the pew knew that they were apostate, they'd throw them out. So the strategy was hang on to the trust funds, hang on to the money, hang on to the properties we control, and we will gradually educate the layman into this new approach to theology. And then finally, we will take control of everything. The gradual process of feeding you theological poison until you become immunized enough so that you don't know what's happening to you. And when you wake up to what's happening to you, it's too late. They've got everything. And he's speaking about when you start taking away the authority of scripture, it filters down and affects everything. So that's why we cling to the authority of Scripture, right? Uh, the third question that's been coming to me, and I, and I share this, guys. I know for some of you it's old stuff, but I share it because we've got new people watching us. Praise God, right? we got new people involved in the church, right? Um, three, Joe, your conservative values are the reasons you're in the church and ministry. And all I can tell you is, as someone who grew up outside the church, my conservative values were ingrained in me as a kid by my family, right? We grew up on the poor side of town, right? Wrong side of the tracks. There were no dads on our street. Our mom worked seven days a week. She was the authority in our household. And, uh, and so, so we didn't go to church until the church bus came down the street and our neighbors invited us and, and we went. And what happened was the church, the church matched the values 
uh, of, of that were instilled in me when I was introduced to it. You understand what I'm saying? Is that as I, we had a certain belief in my family, you're going to work. Uh, you, you better accept your situation and deal with it. There was a cold reality to our household. Um, we had, we had those kind of values, even though we were what we would consider dirt poor. Um, it was the church that matched those values, right? The church didn't change my values. The church matched those values. And if the church or a particular denominational structure were to depart from those grounded truths, then I would leave that denomination before I would leave the values instilled in me which is really weird because as a non-church family, we lived out a lot of biblical values when I was a kid growing up. We just didn't know it. You know, we can get into another theological question here where my boss, my first boss, Pastor Curran said, I was a good argument for Cal a good argument for Calvinism, but uh, I don't want to get into that. That's, that's, that's a little too much into the weeds, but uh, I found the church matched our values. And so we were comfortable there. Now, do all denominations match that? No. But the Nazarene denomination, it matched those values that we had already believed. And if the Nazarene church was to drift away, as in some cases it does, then I'm siding with the values that were introduced to me. And, and like I said, oddly enough, those were biblical values, even when we didn't know they were biblical values, right? We didn't have a born-again Christian in my family until the early 1970s when my sister was was baptized during that Jesus generation. So, so no, I was not influenced by the religious right in terms of my core beliefs. Those core beliefs were instilled in me at home, aided and supported as I saw a match in scripture and uh, in the denomination we were a part of. And so I support um, what the scripture says, right? The authority of scripture will always trump the denomination. Authority of scripture will always trump any, any personal desires that I might have. Uh, so number four, this is the fun one. Um, okay, number four is, what do you mean when you say, I don't need rescue? I've been saying that a lot. Church does not need rescue. Well, sorry if I say this in a wrong way. I, I don't want to take away anyone's antichrist. But for clarification, while I don't believe in a traditional eschatology, traditional eschatology, for the last 50 years has been Hal Lindsey and Tim LaHaye and the late great planet Earth stuff. I don't, I don't subscribe to that. I do believe, however, that Jesus is coming again. The scripture is very clear. It's just not going to look like we think it's going to look like, right? Uh, I believe the church is going to be victorious. And that's why I don't think it needs rescue. We assail the gates of hell. I, 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 how can a Bible-believing church uh, lose? <laughs> how can a Jesus-centered church lose, right? Um, the church is going to be victorious. Now, I'll qualify that by saying, I don't know if America will be along for the ride, but the church will be victorious. And America can be part of the church, but the church isn't necessarily always America, okay? Um, which leads to number five. What do I think about the future of the church? I just love it. Like, I'm some important person here, but I do get asked that question. What do I think about the future of the church? Um, in America, I see hard times because we're so soft. I think we're starting to see that now. We're we're never we've we've never had to trust anything beyond being an American, right? That's the easiest thing for us to do. It's uh you know I'm an American and everything's been okay. Cars don't blow up outside of our house. Uh, by and large, we can say anything we want, do anything we want, right? So uh, uh, Americans are soft, right? We're very soft, but in general, for the church. Uh, while I still can see some hard times, but globally, I'm very optimistic because life outside of the country, out of this country and away from the West up to now has been very hard. It's been brutally hard. And what they've come to recognize is that everything else was, was garbage. You know, the political systems, the worldviews that were pressed upon them in South America and Africa, those things have proven to be failures and they're waking up and they're desperate for God. And that's why the church is growing in those places um, and rejecting the Western theology that's inf in infiltrating, they're trying to infiltrate their culture because our theology has become so corrupt because we have a bad view of, of scripture. But those folks were desperate for God and America in the West needs God. It needs to be desperate for God, but it won't admit it or humble itself to acknowledge that, right? For some reason, Western culture believes it has been the author of its own blessings. And uh, yeah, it doesn't get it. So that's why I think there's hard times ahead. 
um, as we, we, we move a little further on here. Uh, and finally, someone asked me, what's the future of Burbank Faith? And that one's a little, little harder to answer because, um, you know, I do keep asking the question. My glasses are driving me crazy right now. Uh, I do keep asking the question, uh, uh, why did God save us when camps and corporations and businesses and other churches closed uh, after COVID? You know, huh, my first Sunday, we had about 29 people at Burbank, one kid, one teen. Last Sunday, for the first time since COVID, we came back from COVID, we, we were at 30 uh, in person. And our numbers have slowly climbed from like 7 to 12, 12 to 15, 15 to 20. In the last few weeks, we've been in the 20s. And then last week, we're in, we were about 30 people. It's like, why did God save us? What's the big plan? Uh, and the only thing that keeps coming back to me is for us as a church to keep preaching the word, whether fashionable or non-fashionable, to keep sharing the truth of God. Um, and uh, we live that with our lives. And, and, and I think that in terms of, okay, let's just say I have 15 people in church. But if 15 people have 10 people they touch every week, from family members to co-workers and different things, they're essentially part of our church in one way or another because that person that's in our church is ministering the gospel. So when they come to church, I give them the gospel through the spirit, of course, right? Um, and, and here's another thing in terms of the future of the church. I don't burn out on preaching, chatting, studying, discussing, or sharing the word of God. That, that never burns me out, okay? But I'll admit, and I, I think this is a truth across uh, across the, the spectrum of church, is that I am burned out on event planning. I am completely wiped out on event planning. Uh, from being a youth pastor all those years, you know, game night, this night, that night, beach trip, that. Uh, church banquets, uh, church meetings, all those type of things, right? You know, I wasn't called to be an event planner, right? If not, I, they would have, you know, if, if event planning was important, they'd find those people that run those those wedding chapels and those those wedding coordinators and make them pastors of churches because that's kind of like where the church has gone, right? Uh, um, and I wasn't called to be an event planner. It sucks the life out of me faster than kryptonite does Superman. Now, I've been blessed to have people who do that sort of thing, but as a called minister to preach the word, that's that's not my calling. You know, I never dread bringing the word of God, but I have a dread of running banquets, Easter egg hunts, and sunrise services. I have a dread of running community events that provide no real opportunity to share the word of God, but we do them because then we can say, hey, we're doing community events, right? And, uh, and we look really good, uh, you know? And I, I believe, you know, this represents the church uh, building to COVID and after COVID. Uh, people are burned out on the events all the time, right? Uh, you know, you know, it used to be if the church doors are open, you're always there. It's like, no, sometimes you need to be at your work party. Sometimes you need to be playing softball with your work people or you need to be at that PTA function. Do you still need to meet for worship at least once? Absolutely. Do you need to be in a Bible study? Absolutely. I don't dread fellowship. Um, but, uh, but people, uh, uh, but people never have time for fellowship because we're always event planning, right? And and I think God saved us <clears throat> for potlucks, meals together, worshiping together, and learning about Him together. But I don't know if He saved us so we can run another huge event to to show that we're alive in the community. And uh, I, I I don't know what that means for our future, uh, but I do know this: uh, we keep preaching the Word of God. Uh, when, when everything was crazy, uh, March 13th, you know, 2020, when the shutdown really kicked in, um, we preached the word of God and we've continued to do that. Now you might say, well, Joe, you're doing it. Well, no, you don't understand. Everyone that has given, everyone that has clicked on, everyone, you've supported us to allow us to keep doing this. And so I think that's why God has kept us alive. And, and again, I don't know if it's about building the numbers back up to 50 or 75, but maybe taking the, the 15 to 30 and then having you recognize that, that you are a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have your own little cabin that God has given you, young families or children in your household. You know, someone had a granddaughter born uh, last night, um, friends that you work with, 
that you bring salt and light into their lives by sharing the word of God. And so um, uh, I don't know if in this case, attendance really matters. And I'm, I'm gaining more peace on that. Just preach the word of God. You were called to preach the word of God. You were called to live the word of God. We were all called to do a specific task. So we fulfill those tasks within the church. And we got to leave behind that 20th century model, which was beautiful for the 20th century. But folks, it's 2023. So that's where we're at. Rick Savage, thank you for sticking with me. Um, so uh, I'm going to let it go there. And uh, my name again, thank you for clicking on. Hit like, 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 share, share, share. <clears throat> I'm going to, I got to get to my in-person service now. But thank you so much. Uh, we'll be back on track tomorrow. We've got our Burbank Faith Good Mornings throughout the week. And then next Sunday, we'll be back in Samuel. We just wanted to make sure we covered uh, uh, Ruth. And uh, we did Judges on Wednesday Bible study, Ruth. And then we'll continue to work our way through Samuel. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Jesus is Lord, Rick. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. I uh, hope, uh, hope you and Dave are good. We missed you last week. I uh, hope you guys are well. Um, okay, let's pray, and then I will get you guys out of here. Lord, thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for this time. Lord, I, I pray for Shirley as Shirley shares this Sunday, Lord, and and that she would recognize the gift you've given her and that we would hear her, not necessarily as one of our own, but that we would hear her as uh, your person bringing us your word this morning. So I pray for that, Lord. I pray for those that have watched us. They're going to click on now and click on later, Lord. Find us faithful in everything that we do. Uh, Lord, let us not be caught up with things that we have no control over. Um, but, uh, but just we do have control over living this life, Lord. Practicing this believing loyalty in you. Lord, uh, thank you for the hope we have. Be with these folks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Awesome sauce. Thank you so much. Please, again, uh, hit like, like, like. Share, share, share. Uh, I do want to... Uh, Include at the bottom here. Uh, this is our, in the comment box down there, it is our sign up genius. Uh, as you guys know, I'm on the board at Granite Ridge. Kids Camp is coming July 17th to the 21st. I know some of you out there are probably too old to go to camp, but, but we cover every second of every minute of every hour, all 90 of the hours that we are at Kids Camp, we covered in prayer. And it literally spreads across the whole country from the East Coast all the way here. So uh, we have all the hours broken up into 15 minute slots. And if you can click on that, no one's gonna ask you for any personal information or anything. Just type your name into a slot and it leaves room if you wanna make a comment. Just type your name into a slot and fill those slots for us as uh, we build towards camp. We're proud that we kind of got this out uh, early this year, but please click on that and, um, and we'll cover everything in prayer. Thank you for your prayers for me. Uh, and we will see you uh, very, very soon. Bye-bye.